Welcome to the lecture series on vitamins and nutrition. Today we are going to look at this particular vitamin pyridoxin which we have already seen in the previous session but we just started with the historic introduction to pyridoxin and little bit about its toxicity. Today we are going to look into some more aspects of pyridoxin especially its metabolic role and its role as a cofactor in transamination and various other decarboxylation reactions that occur in our body. This particular vitamin pyridoxin is a very interesting vitamin and uh, this particular vitamin exists in three different forms. In fact, it will be more appropriate to call this particular vitamin as a family of vitamin with the pyridin like nucleus. Okay, so, you find three different versions of pyridoxin uh, rather you could say different derivatives of pyridoxin but this one PLP pyridoxal 5 phosphate is supposed to be the activated form of pyridoxin that has been used as a coenzyme or cofactor in metabolic reactions. We already saw the historic background of pyridoxin and how Paul Georgi was involved in elucidating exactly the role of this particular vitamin followed by various team of scientists who had contributed in the structural elucidation and uh, yeah it has been a long way since this particular vitamin has been well characterized right from the early days where it was associated with deficiency conditions connected with acrodynia in rats. So, this is the background which we have already seen. Today we are going to go further into the overall functions of this particular vitamin pyridoxin. So, if you look at this particular vitamin, this vitamin is available in variety of sources and uh, this particular vitamin is seen in different types of uh, food substances. Let us say you have the meat products tuna, turkey and salmon and you also have them in abundance in various vegetables. You find over here this particular vitamin either it is seen as in a free form or it is found along with the uh, phosphate derivative, the PLP derivative as such although that is the activated form in which it is available in circulation in the cellular metabolism in our body. In fact, we are going to see shortly how this particular vitamin is more effective in its free form for absorption because before and after phosphorylation, although the functional role is associated with that, but as far as absorption is concerned, the free form is more preferred. In fact, it is a thermolabile vitamin. So, you see here 40 percent of the vitamin may be destroyed by cooking. So, you see the content, the content of this particular vitamin as you see in tuna the fish supposed to be very high close to meat products. So, for people who are vegetarians they need to supplement with uh, different sources of food for vitamin B6 pyridoxin. In fact, it is become mandatory nowadays to fortify food substances and cereals with pyridoxin, but yes you do have a limit of pyridoxin uh, amounts that can be taken per day. So, you see an average adult needs close to 1.5 to 2 mg of vitamin because we have seen earlier this is one particular vitamin where if you could take up in more quantity you could end up in severe toxicity. So, that way this particular vitamin needs a very close monitoring we are going to see that shortly here is a picture overall function of this particular vitamin. So, you see here sphingolipid biosynthesis. So, this is connected with neurologic health. Then you have heme biosynthesis where your hemoglobin oxygen transport. So, ends you might have anemia conditions, glycogen metabolism yes glyconeo glycolysis and glycogenolysis to release energy. You need enzymes which are dependent on pyridoxin folate biosynthesis again like heme biosynthesis this is the pathway for even the synthesis of hemoglobin this is like packing up of hemoglobin in the proper way for transporting oxygen. Here again sphingolipid biosynthesis neurotransmitter biosynthesis and degradation and again all the amino acid biosynthesis. 
So, you see the role of pyridoxine is quite essential without which you, you would not have most of the metabolic functions happening. So, we have seen now the sources of B6. Now, we are going to look at some of the toxicity connected with pyridoxine. So, pyridoxine is supposed to be a good water soluble vitamin although this is the only vitamin with significant toxicity means many vitamin whenever taken especially water soluble vitamin even if taken in excess can be eliminated by kidneys. So, you do not have a problem that way. So, it is eliminated probably your urine is enriched with the excess vitamin water soluble vitamin taken and for fat soluble vitamin we have been seeing this and you heard me say this often that they can lead to toxicity or hypervitaminosis especially when taken in large quantity, but that is not the case for water soluble vitamin except pyridoxine. So, you see that if the intake would exceed 200 mg per day uh, can lead to real neurologic complications. Okay. So, you see that there is one more problem connected with this particular vitamin. I would be repeating this example later part when I am going to elaborate exactly how this would function especially this particular drug isoniazid. It is a very important drug and this drug is used in the treatment of tuberculosis. Although tuberculosis is a uh, disease that responds only to multi drug therapy, isoniazid is one of the drug along with uh, rifampicin and uh, pyrazinamide. Isoniazid is a very nice drug, but this if you look at the structure of it, this is isonicotinic acid, it is not nicotinic acid or the niacin derivative as we call it. So, this is a different derivative which can compete with the pyridoxine function. So, you have a problem this can induce B6 deficiency. So, that way this particular drug because it also has a pyridoxine nucleus can be actually preferred by the enzymes and can be activated in a similar fashion like pyridoxal phosphate but eventually may not be really the kind of drug it should be because it is not a vitamin it is a drug and although this particular compound has a different mechanism of action in inhibiting tubercle bacilli in this case you will find it uh, competing with isoniacid isonicotinic acid hydroxide competing with pyridoxine giving rise to uh, a kind of toxicity connected with pyridoxine utilization in our body. Now, if you look at the absorption of pyridoxine, it is quite interesting to note. So, PLP is a major coenzyme form, but before we could arrive at PLP, you have to look at where it all starts. So, the dietary source of vitamin B6, it all happens through passive diffusion, what we call it like the free form diffusion. So, this happens in the jejunum and ileum the small intestine, you have membrane bound alkaline phosphatases, they are the ones which will cleave the phosphate group. If at all pyridoxine is available from vegetable sources in the form of a phosphate group. So, you would see here most of the PNP, PLP, PMP, okay, the enzymatically hydrolyzed in the small intestine the corresponding uh, pyridoxin, pyridoxol and pyridoxamine derivatives because the phosphate group the fifth position is uh, added with the phosphate group it is removed because only in this form it is much easy or rather more efficient for passive absorption. So, by passive diffusion it crosses the gastrointestinal tract and you find it is bound with the albumin and it is transported that way. So, if you could look at estimate the amount of pyridoxin, the pyridoxal phosphate PLP is supposed to be the uh, abundant source of pyridoxin around 60 percent in our body followed by PN pyridoxin and you have the pyridoxal or pyridoxalamine, pyridoxamine. So, the aldehyde form that is the PLP pyridoxal phosphate is basically the most important format. If you look at the structure uh, you need to go back to the structure I can show you. So, this is the pyridoxal the PLP version of it. 
So, pyridoxin and pyridoxamine the three versions. So, this is what we call it like the PLP form because the fifth position you add a phosphate group. You could have a phosphate group even here and even for this for pyridoxamine as well as for pyridoxin. So, if it is going to be there for pyridoxamine it is called PMP and for pyridoxin it is called PNP and for pyridoxol it is called PLP. So, that is the version. So, this is the formoil group the aldehyde group and PLP is supposed to be the active form of pyridoxin available in a metabolic process. So, you look here in this picture once it gets inside from the diet. So, this is the source the dietary source yeast, tuna, meat all the uh, nuts whatever we have seen. So, it goes over there okay, and uh, you have converted into the active form pyridoxal 5 phosphate by the kinase pyridoxal kinase PDXK pyridoxal kinase does the phosphorylation. So, let us say if you have a membrane going inside the membrane or going outside the membrane it has to be in free form, but the moment it comes inside the membrane okay, inside the cells the pyridoxal kinase and puts up a phosphate group phosphorylates pyridoxin so that it does not go out. So, same thing is being done for glucose glucose 6 phosphate in the glycolytic pathway. So, this would trap pyridoxin inside the cell for its metabolic function to kick start and in the PLP form. Okay. So, it is also released into the stream and travels to tissues and binds to albumin, but when it is going to cross any membrane bound it needs to be in the free form. So, this is the norm in which the metabolism the absorption of pyridoxin happens. So, look over here. So, this is what I was trying to tell you entry or exit only in the deposphorylated form across a membrane. So, you have plasma alkaline phosphatases they remove the phosphate group prior to cellular uptake from the blood. So, the plasma alkaline phosphatase in the plasma in the blood would take the job of removing the phosphate group if a cell needs pyridoxin it comes inside by passive diffusion. So, the same thing happened across the gastrointestinal tract. So, they have to cross the small intestine barrier before it could go and uh, get inside the system. Now, you see over there intestine it goes to the liver and then it goes to the blood and then to the tissues and finally, if you have to look at the metabolite. Okay. So, metabolite is 4 pyridoxic acid. So, 4 pyridoxic acid is the metabolite which is excreted in the urine. So, you see over there in the liver the phosphatases basically remove the phosphate group and kinases add the phosphate group and that is how it is traversed across. So, you see there in the blood the albumin PLP is the carrier protein albumin bound with PLP basically in that form it is transported across and when it has to go inside a tissue it is basically deposphorylated it comes inside and again it is phosphorylated. So, you see this uh, arrows back and forth how the pyridoxal is getting converted to a phosphate group and the phosphate group is removed. So, vice versa kind of a reversible reaction that happens because PLP is actually the active form of the enzyme. Now, you look here. So, 10 percent a very small amount is retained in the liver. So, most of them is excreted out it is being used and excreted out, but very interesting thing to notice almost 70 to 80 percent there is a correction here 70 to 80 percent uh, of vitamin pyridoxin is stored in the muscle. So, that is one of the reason when even during deficiency conditions muscle will have a good reserve of pyridoxin and it takes a while for the muscle to completely get depleted out of pyridoxin because this acts like a kind of a reservoir although muscle would also need it and uh, muscles basically from that reservoir it would be taken up during the times of deficiency. A point comes where it is like completely depleted then we show, we show all the symptoms of pyridoxin deficiency. So, you see that in this case liver uh, 
takes the place of storage, but compared to muscle the amount stored in the liver is quite less significantly less. So, if you look at the summary quick summary of the reactions we are going to see one by one elaborately right now. So, this is what I said how isoneous it. So, you look at the structure that is that is a way you compare how this could compete with the other compounds. So, isoneacid is a hydrazine derivative to a nicotinic acid even that is the way how it is synthesized. So, you see the structure here you have a pyridine ring, pyridine ring all forms pyridoxal, pyridoxal pi for, uh, phi phosphate the PLP version then you have pyridoxamine again the pyridine ring. So, we have seen this. So, in isoneacid again you see here the pyridine ring with the hydrazine derivative added over here. So, that is one of the reason how isoneacid could compete with the function of pyridoxal in inhibiting the enzymes that use pyridoxin as a cofactor. So, you see that what all different kinds of reactions that PLP could help uh, catalyze along with the respective enzymes trans amination reactions. So, you see that oxaloacetate to glutamate. So, oxaloacetate to glutamate you are adding uh, the amino group you are transferring the amino group. So, you get aspartate and alpha ketoglutarate ok. So, you see here aspartate and aspartic acid is fundamentally the compound resulting and alpha ketoglutarate is basically the glutamic acid being removed uh, the amino group being removed that results in alpha ketoglutarate. Similarly, serin you have the deamination. So, in case with transamination the tra amino group is transferred from glutamic acid ok. So, that is why you have alpha ketoglutarate whereas, in deamination you remove the amine group altogether. So, here you have the amine group being removed and released as ammonia where you get pyruvic acid because serin is an hydroxy amino acid, but the carbon uh, number both serin and pyruvate is a 3. So, originally serin was derived from alanine which consists of uh, 3 carboxylic acid it is an amino acid, but you add hydroxy group for serin. So, the hydroxy group has been removed ok and you have pyruvate this is again a alpha carboxyl acid. Then you have decarboxylation reactions let us say for histidine decarboxylation results in histamine. Then you have condensation reactions where glycine and succinyl CoA there is a condensation and you have alpha amino levulinic acid. So, this is how the overall mechanism that happens. So, you see there you find this particular pyridoxal PLP 5 phosphate actually providing the basis for amino transferase reaction and also for racemases. Again you find aldolases taking use of PLP as a cofactor and decarboxylase again taking PLP as a cofactor. So, you see there are different zones in which this particular cofactor pyridoxal phosphate PLP could contribute depending on the kind of enzyme that they help in catalysis. So, you look at over here let us take a quick look the summary of uh, mechanism or the key features of the mechanism. So, they have an ability to form an imine ok through the aldehyde group that is why the PLP is the active form the form oil derivative is the active form. So, in this case the nitrogen acts like a kind of a strong electron withdrawing group. So, it is a electron sink and that is that gives the pull for the PLP to be effective as it is seen in all these transaminase and decarboxylase reactions. In fact, PLP forms a shift space with the epsilon amino group of a specific lysine group of the amino transferase enzyme I will better put it this way. So, most of the reactions are catalyzed by enzymes and in this case you are looking at amino transferase enzyme 
So, the active site of the aminose transferase enzyme as a lysine residue. So, that is what we are trying to understand. So, this lysine residue interacts with PLP. Okay. So, when this lysine residue interacts with PLP, so lysine residue is part and parcel of the amino transferase enzyme. Now, when this happens, the aldehyde group of PLP forms a shift space, a linkage. Now, the alpha group of the amino acid substrates displaces the epsilon amino group of the active site lysine residue uh, and this process is what we mean by transamidation. So, here you find exactly the mechanism in which this proceeds. So, the resulting aldehyde can now lose a proton carbon dioxide or an amino acid side chain and this proceeds to become a quinoid intermediate. So, if you look at over here the quinoid intermediate, this eventually acts as a nucleophile in various reaction pathways. So, this is the nutshell of exactly how the reaction proceeds. You may have doubts, but when we are going to look into some more examples and finish with the discussion, probably most of your questions and doubts would be answered. Now, look at this reaction you can visualize the reaction right now. So, this is tyrosine, tyrosine is a aromatic amino acid and it also has a hydroxy group. If you remove this hydroxy group what you are left with you have alanine. So, in fact, para hydroxy phenyl alanine is tyrosine. Now, there is this enzyme tyrosine transaminase and this is catalyzed by PLP which we have seen right now. You see there the PLP structure and again you see there it is a transamination reaction. So, the amino group is basically replaced by a keto group. Here you have a para hydroxy phenyl pyruvic acid and this kind of transamination reactions can be catalyzed effectively by tyrosine transaminase. And you find this tyrosine transaminase making use of PLP as a component and only because of that you get this final compound. So, you look here many transamination reactions ends essentially require PLP as a cofactor. We have one more mechanism look at this phenylalanine and here you have a phenylalanine hydroxylase and this is a picture that tells you how tyrosine in turn came from phenylalanine. So, without this enzyme you cannot have tyrosine. So, there is this hydroxy group can you see the structure of this entire thing what is the difference between this structure and this structure that extra bit of hydroxy group. So, that is why it is called hydroxylase phenylalanine hydroxylase once this hydroxy group is added now it becomes tyrosine. Now, tyrosine transaminase would ensure the removal of amino group. The moment you remove amino group it becomes hydroxy or alpha hydroxy phenyl pyruvic acid. Now, this particular compound yes proceeds further and uh, we need not look at it right now, but this is one of the key steps where phenylalanine is basically metabolized and lot of conversions happen in between and in every stretch you find a biochemical reaction proceeding further. Now, this is also a very interesting reaction here you see L dopa and this particular compound is of paramount importance in the treatment of Parkinson's disease okay, akinesia rigidity tremor. So, there will be shaking there will be postural problem and all sorts of things concerned. And uh, here you find this reaction where L dopa. So, you have this particular compound basically it starts from tyrosine. So, you have a para hydroxy tyrosine phenylalanine you have an additional hydroxy group that is why it is called dihydroxy phenylalanine. So, this is dihydroxy phenylalanine which is now decarboxylated 
So, this is what we call it like dopa L dopa. So, L dopa is dihydroxyphenylalanine. Now, this one undergoes a change where after decarboxylation by pyridoxal phosphate you could add a phosphate group to it, but before that the decarboxylation reaction happens and you see over there dopamine is released. So, L dopa the structure between this and this if you look at you are just removing only this carbon dioxide and once you get rid of this carbon dioxide ok. So, eventually what you have you have dopamine ok. So, conversion of levodopa into dopamine it facilitates the conversion of excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. So, glutamate is supposed to be a excitatory neurotransmitter because there are two types of nerve interactions happening inhibitory neurotransmitter and excitatory neurotransmitter each function in their own level or right in bringing out a very synchronized reactions. So, you see that PLP does the conversion of biochemical conversion of uh, excitatory neurotransmitter glutamic acid to a inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA that sounds very interesting and these are some of the important neurotransmitters present in the mood regulation. So, the reward cycle you have this particular vitamin. So, if a person is being deprived of this particular compound because of the source lack of the source cofactor then all the other reactions would also be affected. So, that is why this particular reaction catalyzed by PLP is so important for us. Here you find one more role in glucose metabolism where PLP you see there the glycogen, the glycogen is broken down to give you glucose 1 phosphate by phosphorylases and glycogen phosphorylase is found in the liver where it is used to break down glycogen into glycogenolysis. So, when glucagon or epinephrine is released, so these are all two hormones, glucagon is released when our body needs to additionally release energy molecules from or energy from the stored molecule or from carbohydrates, these two hormones are supposed to be the stress hormones. So, when a person needs energy, so these hormones are released and they would break down glycogen to release energy and uh, the glycogen releasing glucose 1 phosphate would be the source for energy. This is how even glycogen is broken down in the muscles when we do exercise. In fact, you look over here, this enzyme does not exploit reactive alkyl aldehyde group but utilizes only the phosphate group on the PLP to perform the reaction. So, you look over here in the glucose metabolism if you want to derive glucose molecules you are dependent on the glycogen sources and phosphorylase would catalyze this reaction whereby not only it is broken, but a phosphate group is added over here. So, that is how you get glucose 1 phosphate. So, the reaction proceeds further to release more of this active form of glucose 1 phosphate which would be taken up inside the cells to perform the function. Now, we look at role of PLP in glucose metabolism. So, you see over there the acid catalysis ok. So, here you have a proton donor where it is enzyme bound PL and uh, you see over there how this cleavage reaction happens. So, you see there the cleavage happens. So, phosphate group of PLP has a very important role to play. So, as you cleave more amount of energy can be realized in this particular reaction. Here we have one more example of heterolytic bond cleavage. So, you see there hemine formation and how this particular imine formation is present that can fit into the major picture of understanding the role of pyridoxine. So, you see there the enzyme bound PLP carries the particular reaction and here it acts like a kind of an electron sink 
providing the reaction and this is how the cycle proceeds. So, we are going to wind up for today's session I will summarize and I will finish off with a question. So, what are the sources of pyridoxin? What are the three different forms of pyridoxin? How pyridoxin gets across the gastrointestinal tract and how it is transported and how it is made available? What is the main metabolic role of pyridoxin? So, that will be the discussion for today and in the coming session we are going to look at little more reactions and the deficiency disease concerned with pyridoxin. Thank you for your attention.